Hey everybody, welcome back. Well, we're going to dig into Exodus with the plagues. We're going to talk about the two witnesses of Revelation. So, with that said, I'm going to go to Revelations and talk about the two witnesses first. Because I remember I told you Aaron and Moses were the two witness types then. There is much to be disputed about who the two witnesses will be. You know, God doesn't tell us. He doesn't tell us in his word. You see, many say it's going to be Moses and Elijah. And many say it's going to be Moses and Enoch. Uh, they go back to where uh, Enoch was taken up. And never died. So they say he'll come back. And, um, you know, we just don't know. That's the truth. We don't know. God can use anybody he wants to. He has them hidden, I'm sure. I'm sure they are here probably now. Uh... They are going to be two real men. They will be prophesying and warning in Jerusalem. They will end up being slain by the beast and martyred. And then at the end of their testimony, which remember I told you in Revelation 12, the time that the woman is in the wilderness is the same amount of time that the two witnesses prophesied. So the type to begin with was Moses and Aaron in Exodus, okay? There is a lot of similarities between Exodus and Revelations. <laughs> it, it, it's, but it's our time for Revelations. And, you know, the word tells us uh, in, I think it's in Isaiah, let me find it, talks about woe to those that want to go back down to Egypt, well, you know, since Isaiah 31, verse 1, woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong, but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Well, there's a lot said in that, okay? So can you just imagine, this is talking about the way people spiritually are, and it's comparing it to when the Israelites were delivered out of Egypt, spared the plagues, spared the death angel, were given the blood of the lamb for protection under God's grace. And when they were out in the wilderness, I mean, they weren't out there long at all after they saw the hand of God part the waters, <laughs> uh, feed them manna in the wilderness. I mean, God was showing his power to them. After they had not heard from him for 400 years, because see, Israel would always go astray and follow other gods and all that kind of stuff. And um, they'd go into bondage, they'd come out, they'd go back in bondage. I mean, it was over and over and over. It's no different than today. And, um, you know, America, United States, is a very young country. It really is, if you really think about it. And um, everything's not about us. But we are the Christian nation that has put out the gospel more than any other country. Uh, you know, we've done a lot of things for our faith. But here's the deal. You know, we get deceived. We get pulled in. We get, just, you know, just confused. And we don't realize that we end up taking on things that are not of God and it's in our walk with him 
it's on the mainstream Christian networks. Um, I'm not saying it's all bad. I've gotten some really good insight and uh, everything from them. Listen, you just have to, um, you have to know the word and you have to know when someone's lying to you. And, you know, we're in such a time of deception that even the learned are getting totally off the mark <laughs> because this is exactly what's help what's happening in our nation today uh, in the world they're going to back down to Egypt they're going back to bondage for freedom and they're looking to human beings you know this is what's saying and stay on horses and in trust in chariots well you know Let's think about this. Listen, this is what really woke me up to what was going on in our political scene in the United States. They just took it too far and I started realizing that, hey, I had to really revisit Zechariah 1 and the four carpenters. I had to really revisit what was happening in our country and then I started really seeing the deception that, you know, the ungodly got what they wanted for so long and got emboldened. And now here we are being led down the same path and we're going to end up hating what we wanted. Yep, we really are, everybody, because it's going to be bondage. It's going to be, listen... Things are going to get really bad, everybody. You can't be shaken. We have seen nothing yet. Right now we're seeing violence and chaos, chaos, chaos. That's the word of the day. Chaos, 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 okay? Look, we got to have our guard up. We really do. And we've got to pull away from this beast system. But many are not. So, if we are of the mindset that we follow the rest of the sheep, you're going to find out that the way the sheep went isn't the way you want to be. The sheep, if you follow the sheep, listen, sheep are really dumb. They really are. That's why they have to have a shepherd, everybody, because they're really dumb. And in that case... We are the sheep. We have a shepherd. Jesus Christ is our shepherd with his Holy Spirit. And that's how he communicates. That's his voice. That's how we know his voice versus the devil. You know, the devil is going to look like a lamb. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's going to be the voice of the dragon. You have to know how to distinguish between the voice of the dragon, even though it might appear as a lamb. And, you know, Jesus even said, I send you among wolves. <laughs> you know, you're a sheep. Wolves eat the sheep. Okay. So, you trust your, your shepherd. But here's the thing. Sheep are really stupid. They're really dumb animals. Okay. And here's how stupid they are. They will get... See, the shepherd tends to the, to the sheep's ears and, and their wool and everything. Because the flies, <coughs> excuse me, the flies will embed into the sheep's ears, lay their eggs, um, and then these get into their brain. And the sheep will go insane and they'll start banging their heads on the rocks. They'll kill themselves. Listen, sheep have to have a shepherd. They have to have a shepherd. They'll go right off the cliff. They'll bang their heads. They do really dumb stuff. And we are sheep. We really are. That's why we have a shepherd. There's your proof. You don't believe you're a dumb sheep? <laughs> There's your proof. I'm a dumb sheep. Without the Holy Spirit, I'd have done been toast. I mean, I thank him so much for his truth, his Holy Spirit, all that he did for us. I thank him because, you know, don't get angry at your brethren 
for being not seen because listen this is why we have a job to do and we do not smite our brethren we are going to tell them the truth now if they want to kick you in the face and say all kinds of hateful stuff to you step back step back because maybe the way you presented it to them made them defensive i'm just saying i've had to change this myself um it makes you look at yourself if you ever get something going on someone offend you someone bite your head off or whatever just stand back and ask god you know did i handle this wrong is there something i need to change um I'm not saying that, you know, everything's your fault. No, I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying a lot of times God will let someone offend us to show us an error of our own ways. Because that is where it becomes about us. You see, it's really not about us for all that we go through. Because it's really for us to help others. But when we are on the side of being offended and we've got people doing things wrong to us i'm not trying to say that we're doing people wrong you know like i'm not saying that if you get someone steals from you that you're a thief that's not what i'm saying what i'm trying to convey here is that we are being refined in the fire and sometimes what really upsets us is given allowed to come through for a reason it's to sharpen us. It's to strengthen us. It's to, for God to show us the error of our ways in a certain way that we can refine it. You know, maybe we need to change the tone of our voice. Or maybe we need to be more compassionate. Um, because, you know, hey, we all were blinded. We all, at one time, were going down the wrong path. Believe liars. It's it's very delicate situation. And God is refining us. And then as you stand firm, you know, offenses come, but hey, it's like water off a duck's back. You can't let it really bother you. You just can't. You know, there's places that you can go in like chat rooms or or blogs or more like um, social, like a social place for the brethren or something. And you know, if there's a, a spirit in there that is uh, just so not grounded in the truth of Christ, but they think they have the truth, hey, they can get pretty mean. And um, it'll really suck the Holy Spirit out of you. It really will It'll wear you down. And that's that's not Christ, everybody. That's not the true Christ. It I told you, God doesn't tear down without building back up. And if if your own brethren are out smiting their own brethren, eh, you gotta step back. You gotta step back and you can't engage in it. You can't engage in it, because if you engage in it, and get into this fight. I have been guilty of it myself, you know. You, We live and we learn, right? <laughs> so if you engage in it, then you'll absorb that spirit and it'll really leave you feeling unsettled. It'll just, you know, like suck the life out of you, of the spirit, of the Holy Spirit. Because you can mourn lovingly and leave. <laughs> you know, if that's what you feel you're led to do, just give them a message and leave. Don't interact. You don't have to be rude or mean or anything like that because, you know, you don't want to get infected with a spirit that is not of peace. Remember the, the, the armor, the gospel armor, the armor of God? Remember that. Remember that. You know? We gotta ingrain that in our brain. We really do. We really do, everybody. And then you'll start to see, hey, you know, this is not, this person's not suited up and and they're walking not in the, you know, 
the preparation of peace. They're not walking on it. They don't have it on their feet. They're, they're just out getting angry. Hey, you know, here's the thing, everybody. It's hard to, to accept that our beloved country, a nation that has been blessed by God, has been infiltrated all this time for the majority, I mean, all of our lifetimes. If you're hearing my voice, you, it's been infiltrated since you've been alive with evil. The play wolf, a wolf in sheep's clothing, okay? It's the beast, guys. It is the beast. And it's not for us. It's enslaved us. It's robbed us. But hey, you know, it, it, it's prophesied that it's going to do what it's going to do. There's no sense in getting upset about it. There's no sense in, you can't fight the beast system, guys. You know, when, when God said, leave the tares alone. See, because if we have hate in our hearts, we become what we hate, everybody. We sure do. So, we end up getting sucked into something. And that's what's happened here. And so, it's like we've been living in an altered reality and didn't even realize we were. We really thought that there were, you know, when it says, in God we trust on our money, and then you have the pyramid with the all-seeing eye. I mean, come on. What God is it really talking about? Is that our God? No, it's not. No, it's not, everybody. See, God let us let that be on our money for a long time to warn us. We've just been asleep. Okay, just don't get upset that you've been asleep. Just thank God. Praise Him. Thank you for waking me up, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for showing me the truth. And right now, everybody's getting sucked into this paradigm. And with the selection of what's right. And, and, you know, they all are talking about God, praying to God. Listen, listen, you, you know, we've gone over this. We're here at a time where you have to test the spirits. You have to really go look at what it's about. Because just because someone says God doesn't mean they're talking about our God. The Most High. Jehovah. Yahweh. Okay? And there's two sons and there's two Jesus Christ coming. <laughs> you don't want to be on the first bandwagon. You just don't. There's a false Christ coming before our Father returns with the great white throne with Jesus Christ first at the seventh trumpet and the seventh vial and the seventh seal and then after the thousand years of the millennial reign you know the Godhead's coming down the full Godhead and judgment is final we don't want to be on the wrong side we really don't and well-meaning Christians are getting sucked in and you know, as long as you're sealed with that knowledge, you can still go listen to the news. You can still go listen at what's going on. But you know you're armed. You're armed with the truth. And then you can pray. Then you know who to pray for. If you've got a pastor that you listen to all the time that you like, and he's all pro-Trump and thinking God, you know, God's using Trump to deliver us out of this satanic system and pray for him. Don't get mad. No reason to get mad. It's sad. And when you have compassion, then you'll pull them out of the fire. You know, you'll pray. Prayer is very powerful. Prayer is more powerful than when it, what you or I could say to another person to wake them up, to help them. Prayer is powerful. It's like a nuclear bomb <laughs> on God's uh, power. Because, you know, Jesus is our advocate. He hears our prayers. And um, we do wish that all come into the truth. 
and that they not be deceived. So with that said, we don't want to go back down to Egypt, everybody, for help. We are getting set free. Okay? And this is exactly what it's talk talking about on, in Isaiah 31.1. Horses and chariots, because they are many, and in horsemen, because they are very strong, but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. They think they are. They think God's giving them someone to lead them out of bondage and captivity, and it's just going to be worse than the before. So, that's why I brought this up, because, you know, we had a Pharaoh ruling over this nation for eight years, and he ain't gone. He's not gone. You're going to hear a lot about him in the days to come. I am sure of it. And they're going to put you in this paradigm that, you know, it's good versus bad and da da da. And listen, listen, listen. They're all of the same cloth, everybody. And the fallen angels, when they appear and they start wreaking their flood of lies and chaos and evil. Listen, they're going to pull the same kind of crap. They're going to say, oh, these are the good ones. Oh, these are the bad ones. Oh, they, these are our friends. This, this group of them is not our friends. And they're evil devils. You know, it's hard because when you've lived your whole life and you thought you were living in a reality that was truth and you get woke up. And the Holy Spirit really, really wakes you up. It's like we were living in an illusion. And we were. See? Delusion. I mean, it, listen, we're all on a path. We're all on a way, a journey. And we want to make sure that we stay on the right path with God. And you know what? The majority are not going to be on that path with you but your lord and savior is there's no reason to go with the crowd everybody the crowd's going to go off a cliff i know our numbers are dwindling here it's okay it's okay you know i'm not even like putting in keywords anymore in my videos I'm not. Because who's here is who's here. I'm not doing this for popularity. I don't need Google's and YouTube's keywords. You know, I have the Holy Spirit. If He wants someone to find me, they're going to find me. And what I'm saying. I mean, do you realize how blessed we are? That God woke, is waking us up to the delusions, to the lies. See, just us, just one with God is the majority in his numbers. Cannot go by what we've known by this world and what we think is powerful or, you know, going with the majority. Listen, it says, woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many. You don't go by the numbers. No. Look to the Holy One of Israel, Jehovah, the Most High God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ. Emmanuel, God with us, the one that was on the cross. <laughs> you know, that's what we're going to have to start distinguishing because there are going to be two. What a blessing. What a blessing. God gives us this revelation. Thank you, Lord. It's not popular. The truth is not popular. People want to be stroked. They want candy coating. And then they, of course, 
There's some that are so stiff-necked, they don't want to, they won't want to ever admit they're wrong. Hey, I admit I'm when I'm wrong. I have no problem. That's hum that's being humble. Because when you hang on to something that you've been deceived by, and you hang on to it, and you hang on to it, and you don't want to admit you've been deceived, or you don't want to admit that you just didn't have it all right, you better beware of people like that. Because they'll follow a man right to hell. Okay? I thank God when he corrects me. I'm like, thank you for showing me that. Because, you know, if, if he didn't, and then I'm out here thinking that I'm supposed to be talking to you all, and I'm telling you the wrong thing, and I'm leading you off a cliff, hey, I don't want that responsibility. <laughs> Believe me, I do not want anyone else's blood on my hands. I've done enough damage in my life that God has forgiven me for, you know, for murdering my own children <laughs> in the womb. You know, please, I don't want anybody else's blood on my hands. I, th I thank God I'm forgiven. And all the times I've said something that might have hurt somebody else, hey, thank you, God, for forgiving me because I don't want to hurt anyone. I don't want to be responsible for that. I take that very seriously. I really do. And that's something we don't hear in the Christian community very often, is the, the shepherds, the preachers, the teachers, taking responsibility, really thinking it through. Of what, how much responsibility they have on their backs. Yep, I take it very seriously. I sure do. I sure do. I'm very aware of that. So with that said, let's get into the plagues. Hey, before we get into the plagues, I want to ask you a question. Um, has anyone else noticed strange bird activity? I just... You know, I know others have recorded it on YouTube, and the reason it caught my eye on YouTube was because starting last Friday, it was the first day I noticed it, I have, like, all these different types of birds, I'm talking a lot of them, like flocking, and they're going into my trees, and they're acting very strange, okay, and I mean, it is lots of them. I can't count them. There's, there's all kinds of robins, cardinals, sparrows, everything. Well, they were flying around my yard really erratically. My bedroom window faces the street, the front of the house, and it's a double window. And I was sitting here Saturday doing a study, and I kept catching like a bird's flying really close to my window. Uh, my house does not face the sun, so I know they weren't seeing a reflection or anything like that. I mean, so all of a sudden, they started banging into my window. It was very bizarre. I mean, hard. Banging into the glass hard. And normally, I've got my window open pretty far. And uh, my cat tried to escape the other day, and uh, she pushed the screen out. So the screen wasn't in it. And thank goodness I didn't have the window all the way up because that I usually have it as far because it would have flown right in my room. Several of them. And the one, I mean, hit the window so hard his feathers were still stuck on the glass. I've just, you know, I've just never experienced anything like that. So I just was wondering if anybody else has noticed some strange behavior out of the birds. Um, you know, we, when you watch wildlife and... We'll cover this in the plagues, too. But when you watch wildlife, it, it usually will tell you something. It's a, like a barometer to keep your finger on. But I just find it very odd. It's really odd. You know, I can tell you here in the southeast, we have had record warmth for January and already into February. And it'll be like 75 degrees, 80 degrees in January, and then drop down to like below freezing that night. 
And then it's just insane. It's just the, the weather is not right, everybody. I mean, there's a lot of things that aren't right. But I'm hoping that everybody's really becoming aware of what's going on because there is very strange things happening. And um, again, like I said, we are in the sorrows. But, you know, when that first trumpet really blows, it's going to change everything. And it's on, and it'll be very rapid. But, like I said before, God does nothing without a warning. If you're awake, he will warn you. He will show you. So, now is the time to really seek him because you don't want to wait too long. <laughs> and he said, seek me early. I mean, he knows your heart. He will know. He will hear you. So with that said, let's get into the plagues, okay? I'm going to first start with the two witnesses. And remember, they throw the vials out, which are the plagues in the Revelations. And then we're going to cover Exodus, compare it. Okay? But I think I better start with the two witnesses so that everybody's aware of who they will be as far as what they'll be doing and where they'll be located. No one's going to tell you who they are. There's no one that can tell you that. If God wanted us to know, he'd have wrote it. He'd have said, and a man named John Smith, <laughs> or Moses will return as a two witness, or Elijah, or, you know, listen, we don't know. I don't claim to know things that God doesn't tell us. All right? We'll know when we see them. We will know. But just remember, Satan knows the plan. Satan knows God's plan. He knows his, his word. And uh, we're in such deceptive times, I wouldn't doubt it, that Satan will have his own two witnesses. Okay? <sighs> yeah. So, with that said, let's dig in. So, we're going to go to Revelation 11 right now. And... Now, this is going to tie exactly with Zechariah, where he talks about the two witnesses, and ties right into that, okay? Re Revelation 11, 1. And there was given me a reed, like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and then them that worship therein. This is repeating Zechariah. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and the measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall tread underfoot forty and two months. This is prophecy right here. Paul's talking about the circumcision. It says, Christ, that if you be circumcised, let's just start from verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, the liberty, wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Listen, this is so important, because even now today, we're looking to a man who's our president, who's in the flesh, and we're looking to him to give us liberty. And they're saying, oh, God's using him to do this liberty. Listen, you've already got liberty. It's in Jesus Christ, okay? And if you look to a man, just like Isaiah 31, just I read to you earlier, just like that says, you're going to go into bondage. You've already got a savior. You've already got one that gives you liberty. Wake up. Wake up to see where you're being deceived. All right? Galatians 5.2. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Okay, so what he's talking about was the Jewish law was that they had to be circumcised. They had to actually circumcise the child, the baby, okay? And that was the law. And then when Christ fulfilled that law, the law, he was the grace, you did not have to circumcise your children anymore for them to be considered clean, 
okay? So he's talking about the law. He's using circumcision here. But he's, he's all in all talking about the yoke of bondage, the law, okay? Because we are free in Christ. We don't have to do all these, you know, man-made traditions, all right? Because Jesus fulfilled these things on the cross. It says, um, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Meaning if you are going by the law, he's not going to profit you. You're going to have to fulfill the law. You're going to have to keep keeping the law, and you can't do it. You can't. Because it's through Christ he writes his laws on our hearts with the Holy Spirit. This is how we get refined. We can we cannot use our works. We cannot say that we are righteous because we are only righteous through Christ fulfilling what he did on the cross, okay? And it says, for I testify again to you that every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. So if you wanna keep a piece of the law, okay? Circumcision, yes, this is what he's talking about here, but look at the bigger picture. He's talking about keeping the law. And he says, for I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect to you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. If your justification is by keeping the law and not the Holy Spirit and not the fulfillment of the cross and what Jesus did on the cross, you're saying it's not enough. You're saying that all sin is not forgiven. You're... People get all wrapped up in this just because he's mentioning circumcision at, in this instance because this is what the Galatians were doing. But he's trying to tell them, look, if you're going to follow the law, you have to follow the whole thing. You don't get to pick and choose what pieces of the law you want to choose and then say you're under grace. Because he says, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law, meaning your works. If you're justified by your works, you have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. It's our faith in Jesus Christ that he is our righteousness. His righteousness is wrote into our hearts through his laws and his will. It's not that we have to go and pick and choose laws and keep them. He fulfilled every bit of that on the cross. If you're not walking under grace, you Christ is no effect to you. And this is why I'm so insistent on this because I'm telling you, I was plagued. I was, look, it was a, it was making me cursed, everybody. It really was. And things were getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And it's brainwashing. Faith which worketh by love. He's telling you, you better keep the one commandment Jesus Christ gave you, and that is to walk in his love and to carry his love and for him to be our first love and if he's your first love then you are going to be loving you're going to be very very meek you're going to be very very kind and you will be transformed into his spirit that's how you get the holy spirit it's not through the law it's not through your works i'm just saying it's just dangerous everybody for we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. What is, what is, what did I just say to you yesterday about the meat thing? Okay, that's one of the laws, not to eat pork or unclean things. And if you want to follow that, okay, anything you do that is not in faith, what's faith? Jesus Christ the price he paid on the cross, the fulfillment of the cross. If you don't see the fullness of the cross and everything Christ did on that cross, it's really a big, deep study. I suggest everybody better be doing it because there is so much to cover. I could spend forever on the cross. I really could. You know, kind of like how when he was even on the cross and 
he had to lift his head up just to get a breath. And what was he smelling? The, the garbage dump of Gehenna, which is hell. You know, he couldn't even take a breath, everybody. He couldn't get a breath of fresh air even. He took in death, sin, disease. I mean, if you could see it with your spiritual eyes, you'd understand why there was darkness when he went on that cross. You would understand why the earth shook. Every, some people will make you believe that it was the earth was shaken because evil crucified him. Well, let me tell you something. It goes a lot deeper than that. It goes that he was taking in all sin. He was even taking in the sin of those that hung him on the cross, everybody. See, when you miss the glory, you go to the law. And then you try to mark up your own self-righteousness. See, this is what self-righteousness is. You are creating your own righteousness. And that is blasphemy, everybody. It's the deepest blasphemy, and it'll lead you right down into a hell hole, and you will think you're all righteous, and you'll think you're all good, and you'll be sl sliding, sliding and smiting your brethren, and you will be so disillusioned and, and living in a delusion, you've fallen from grace. And if you've fallen from grace, you're toast. Oh, wow. It was like a smack in my face, everybody. And that's when God really started doing a work in me. Yes, he did. See, he'll use all things for his good. And he sealed me in his word. And I learned how to study for myself. But you know what? You know what we got a lot in the Christian community? We got a bunch of parrots. They just, they're, they're just, they just mock what they hear a man say, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, instead of looking deep into the word and really looking at what it says and not how a man teaches it. If it's bondage, it's not of our Christ. It's not a license to sin. You're not going to willfully do things that are written on your heart when the law is written on your heart through the Holy Spirit, through the power of the cross and grace. You know, it, it doesn't mean you're never going to make a mistake. It doesn't mean you're gonna, not going to fall. It doesn't mean you're not going to say or do something wrong. you got to repent. It's a daily process. We're being refined. And in that same token, You, you can be taught that, you know, our righteous works weave our wo robes of righteousness. Well, yeah, that's true. Here's where the lie comes in. That you are doing those righteous works through your own will, not through grace. See, Jesus is our righteousness. Through the power of the cross, through his love, and when the Holy Spirit is written in your heart, through him writing his laws and his love on your heart, it's through the Holy Spirit and his power in Christ that you are doing his righteousness not your self-righteousness. And that is where your righteous works come from. It's through the Holy Spirit, from the power of the cross and the resurrection. Not our works of the flesh, everybody. Not our works that we feel we've done on our own. Because I'll tell you what, that is, that is dangerous. And it was what leads to legalism. And it's what re leads to self-righteousness and stiff-neckedness and no love, not following the first commandment of the love that Jesus Christ commanded us to do. So you will start smiting your brethren. You'll start provoking. You'll start arguing. You'll start doing all kinds of things because you feel you're self-righteous. This is what happened with the Pharisees. 
This is how they miss Jesus Christ right in front of them. This is so dangerous, everybody. It's so dangerous. This is why I am so strong on teaching you this because it is where man tripped me up. Okay? So, Paul is saying in Galatians 5, you cannot just take it out of context that he's just talking about circumcision. Now he's telling you, if you want to follow the law, you got to follow all of it. You break one, you break them all. That's what he's telling you. It's not just about being circumcised. It's about following the letter of the law. Listen, you want to believe me? Here, I'm going to give you another example. You know when uh, Christ was up on the Mount of Transfiguration and the disciples were there and he was giving them a little preview of what was to come? And so who was transfigured with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration? It was Elijah and Moses. Okay, the lawgiver and the prophets, right? The fathers of the lawgiver and the prophets. Moses was the lawgiver and Elijah was the prophets, father of the prophets, okay? So what did the disciples say? Oh, Lord, shall we make three altars, one for you, one for Elijah, and one for Moses? And the voice of God himself went over them and said, hear him, hear my son, hear him, hear him, okay? So God didn't tell them to make three altars. Because see, Jesus is over that. Jesus is fulfilling the law and the prophets. He did fulfill it. So that is why they were not told to build three altars. And God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. Now, it does not mean that it negates everything that Moses did and Elijah did. There was, it was a time. It was the Old Covenant. It was the Old Testament. Jesus Christ was going to be the New Covenant. He was going to fulfill all things. Okay? And this is why people believe that Elijah and Moses will be the two witnesses. Because they think it's resurrecting the promise and the law. But that's really not what it is. It's God's justification. It's God warning. It's, listen, Jesus fulfilled all those things. Okay? So, Galatians 5, 3, 4, I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. And so if you pick anything out of the law and you want to keep it, you've got to keep the whole law. Verse 4, Christ has become of no effect to you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Remember, whatever is not done in faith is sin, everybody. Faith in Jesus Christ and his works on the cross. It was it. It was enough. See, and that's verse 5. 5. Double grace right there. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Grace. Double grace. Verse 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. That was the commandment Jesus Christ gave to us. Verse 7, ye did run well, who did hinder you, that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion came not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Okay, so here he's saying, faith, if you do not do walk by faith, you're in sin. That is sin. So, if you have done all these things on your own, in your own self-righteousness, 
that is sin. And that, and even if you're well-meaning, okay, it's sin. And a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So if you sin a little, if you take and twist this gospel right here about grace, fallen from grace, you know what? If you if you say this is just about circumcision, then you are leavening the whole lump. That's what you're doing. You're twisting God's word so bad that you, it's it'll turn into a curse on you. Verse ten: I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. Meaning, if anybody comes to you and kicks you. While you're walking in grace and they want to put legalism on you, oh, they're in trouble. Then you're going to get judgment on you if you do that. Mm -hmm. Verse 11, and I, brethren, if yet I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. It's bondage, everybody. It means you can't, you can't operate fully in the, in the Holy Spirit if you are under the law. But if ye be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. This is verse 18. 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murderers, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of with the which I tell you before, as I have told you, also told you in the time past, that ye, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. That's how you test the fruit. That's the fruit, everybody. So, I'm just saying, we have to see it for what it is, everyone. We have to see it for what it is. This is so important. And I'm sorry I got off on that, but I just know that this is where, see, God's word can be very harmful if it's not told in tr total truth. And if it demeans the cross, you have a curse. And you will smite your brethren, you'll have hate in your heart, and you will get self-righteous. I'm, I'm just saying. It's late in the game. I'm not here to please people. I'm not here to go along with what everybody else is saying. I'm telling you what the Word says. I'm telling you what the Holy Spirit conveys in His Word. We are under the new covenant. We are under grace. And if you want to keep even one little piece of the law, you've fallen from grace. So, and then you go start smiting your brethren and you'll get high. You'll get harsh and judgmental and hateful. Hey, no, I, the only reason I can tell you is because God had to correct me on these things. Listen, people that teach, people that preach, People that teach the word, they have a spirit. Okay? We all have a spirit. And what, how we teach, what we teach, even if it's reading the word, their spirit's going to come through that. And if that spirit is not in total grace, 
and the love of the cross and the love of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, it's going to be tainted and it's going to be harmful. And you will see that they will be blinded. They will not see their own faults. They will be so steeped in the law that they will demean the power of the cross. They'll even tell you that some sin is not forgiven in the flesh. You know, David was a murderer. Moses was a murderer. If that, if that were true, then how is David going to be reigning with Christ in the millennium? Tell me that. Tell me that. And he plotted the murder of Uriah, his friend, for a woman, for the lust of the flesh. He lied in wait, in other words, because he orchestrated it. Wasn't manslaughter. Wasn't an accident. Wasn't in the heat of passion. Uriah wasn't even in front of him. But David had a heart for the Lord and he repented and he encouraged himself in the Lord and he got God's grace. Yeah, he had to deal with judgment. See, we make decision and we have to live with the, with the consequences. We, we can be forgiven, but we still have to walk out the consequence. So, see how men get misled? See how men will, will, will argue with you over who the two witnesses will be? They're in mourning, everyone. They're in mourning. Because it's a sad state that this world is in, even the body of Christ. Five out of seven candlesticks are removed out of the body of Christ because they didn't want to keep Christ as their first love and got lied to by the by even well-meaning people and then criticize other preachers criticize other teachers and then that mentality just gets spread because it's a spirit it's an infection and then they'll start smiting their own brethren and just start judging and thinking that they have a special place in the body of Christ. And they don't even see that they're beating their own brethren. They can't even get along in their own body, their own candlestick. They can't get along. They don't want to see the truth. It's sad. And I thank God for waking me up out of that. I really do. I thank God for all he's given me in his truth and his power and his glory and his grace. And it made me realize that the second I wake my eyes up and open them in the morning, that I am under his grace. And I thank him for that. And I know the second my feet hit that floor or before I even open my mouth, I have to be under his grace. You know, there before the grace of God go I. And if you can't understand that little bit of truth right there, then you have no compassion. You're not going to pull anybody out of the fire. You're actually going to be one of the ones that's going to be having a candlestick removed. And let me tell you, the candlesticks have been being pulled out. They have. They have. Because God's not going to stand for it anymore. Anything that demeans his cross and his grace, he's going to pull it. Anything that is self-righteous, let alone just the blatant lies, you know, just let alone that. Even those that think they're well-meaning. This is why the gate gets narrower and narrower and narrower. 
Yeah. It's disturbing. It really is. We have to be grounded in truth, everybody. It doesn't matter what you know, how it goes down. It doesn't matter if you aren't grounded in the, in the grace of the cross and the love of Christ and you haven't kept him as your first love and you demean the power of what he did on that cross and you say it's not fulfilled and you want to go back to legalism. It's sad. It doesn't matter if you know the pattern and the blueprint because you'll believe a delusion, a strong delusion. So today, let's all do something. Let's all do something. Here's my voice. Let's go take a bath and a shower in God's grace. Let's just shower ourselves in his grace and his mercy and his love. Let's do it every day from here on out. Just, just as you would take a shower or a bath to wash off the filth of your flesh, wash it off of your soul. Wash off all of it. Go bathe yourself in the glory of the cross and his grace and his love. Bask in it. Just imagine as he's cleaning off the filth of your flesh, the sweat, the funk. He's washing off your impurities, all things that you believed falsely that demeaned the cross. Repent for it and just let him wash you in that grace and love. And tell me if your spirit doesn't change. Tell me if you don't feel like a new person. Tell me if you don't feel liberty and glory in him. Tell me if you aren't good ready then to go out and pull your brethren out of lies and deception and the lost out of the fire. Then you'll stop looking at the stained garment and you'll look that it's a soul, a soul that God loves, that he wishes to save. And though chaos and insanity and anger and strife all surround you, you're going to be shod in the peace of the gospel, wrapped in your feet, walking in peace. This is how the meek inherit the earth, everyone. The meek shall inherit the earth. It doesn't mean that you're a beat up bride. You've risen above it. Let's all do that today. And let's keep doing it. All right. Let's go back to Revelation 11, 3. I'm so sorry this has taken so long, but that was needed to be done. That was needed to be said. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Verse 3, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Now remember, the sackcloth is for mourning. They are in mourning. It's a sad time, everybody. The world is very, very, very deceived. The body of Christ is getting candlesticks pulled. It is a bad, sad time. And he says, I will give power unto my two witnesses. I will give, to give, meaning, this word is didami, or didami, okay, it means to give, literally, figuratively, adventure, bestow, bring forth, commit, deliver up, give, grant, hinder, make, minister, Number, offer, have power, put, receive, shit, set, show, smite with the hand, strike with the palm of the hand, suffer, take, utter, yield. See, he's given you the authority. He's given them the authority. I'm sorry. He's given the two witnesses his authority. And power, okay? Now, this word power is not the same power that we see in other places. It means I, me, my own, my, meaning of God, his power, his power. 
Very interesting. It's the power of God. Unto my two witnesses. Yes, martyrs. Witnesses means martyrs. Okay? And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. They're standing before God. The God. The most high God. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. We know who hurts them. We know who martyrs them. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Hey, this is, this is just another replication of what happened in Egypt with Moses and Aaron. Verse 7, And when they ha shall have finished their testimony, the beast as that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. Okay, now this is the first beast. Satan uses the first beast, the war machine, the iron teeth, the brass nails. Yeah, because see, it's in the bottomless pit after Satan comes. Because remember, it was wounded to death. And he healed the wound. And he became the beast. He's the second beast. So this beast, when he became the beast, it's in the bottomless pit. It's with all the demonics. It's, it's, it's demonic. And he uses that beast. And when they shall finish their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, that is Jerusalem, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Well, there, that tells you right there what city it's talking about. It's going to become a den of vipers. A, oh, it's going to be nasty. Nasty. Because you know why? All the ungodly will be there. Mm -hmm. All the ungodly. Jesus will set his enemies up as his footstool. Yep, he's going to gather them all together. Right there. Verse 9. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies. Oh, that's the whole world. Okay. Three days and a half. And shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Well, that's the same amount of time that Jonah was in the belly of the whale. That's the same amount of time that Jesus Christ was in the tomb. His body was in the tomb. Let's put it that way. Because he went down to Hades and released the captives while he was laying there. Okay, verse 10. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Listen, they have a, they have a party. They have a celebration. What is the one holiday where everybody sends everybody gifts? It's Christian, supposedly. It's to celebrate the Lord's birth, right? Christmas. They're going to be having their own satanic version of that because they killed the two witnesses because they're going to be like, yay, they're dead. They're not going to fire us with plagues anymore. They're, you know, oh, it's over. We're free. Yeah, we defeated them. You know, evil is going to be perceived as good and good is going to be perceived evil. And they're going to start rejoicing, having a party, having their own little satanic Christmas. And they shall send gifts to one another. Hmm. Verse 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. Oh, they're resurrected. And they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Well, this is the same time that... Um, Jesus is going to be collecting his elect from the four winds, too. Okay? Because guess why? Guess why? Because the only ones that are going to have their feet on the ground right then is, is the ones that are going to get God's wrath. That's the wrath of God right there. Right there. The two witnesses aren't smiting the, those that are uh, in of the body of Christ that are faithful. 
that didn't take the mark. No, they're not smiting them. They're smiting the beast and those that have the mark of the beast. And it says, verse 13, And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Wow. I mean, some are going to uh, repent. Mm -hmm. There's a remnant, okay? There's a remnant. And the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Remember, God said, anyone who calls out on my name will be saved. And this is when the house of Judah wakes up as a whole. There are many that are awake now, and they are messianic Christians, is what they call them. They believe in the Messiah. They believe Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that he was already here, that he was nailed to the cross, he resurrected. Yes, they do. They do. Mm -hmm. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Listen. Don't let man tell you that any woes have passed. They are not. They are not. Verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry and their wrath is come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou should give us reward unto thy servants, the prophets and to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great and should destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. That's the return of Christ pouring out the final wrath of God. Yep. That's it. So, now we're going to go over to comparing the plagues that are the seven bowls of wrath, the vials, compared to the plagues of Exodus. 